Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of C Mask, the Christian Masculinism <laughs> podcast. I'm here with my brave set of co-hosts, the Culture War Crusaders, Will Noland, Nick Stumphauser, and Timothy Gordon. How are you guys doing today? Good, Mike. You? Good. Very Catholic Excellent. this morning. I'm feeling ecumenical. Yes, absolutely. I'm in that. I'm in that that zone right now. So today, just to cut straight to it, we're going to be answering seven questions. Uh, about Roman Catholicism. And so just adds a little bit of context. I was raised Roman Catholic, but like most Italians, it's very much cultural. I'm a product of pretty poor catechesis, I would say, because I fell away um, from the faith, became an atheist for a short period of time, came back to the faith, I guess as a Protestant. But, you know, it's funny. One of my friends said, you weren't really truly a Protestant, which I don't really necessarily know what that means more than I wasn't really entrenched in reformed tradition, whatever the heck that even means. And so about six months ago, you know, I was always this like, yeah, I just follow Jesus, bro. And then I, you know, being a truth seeker, I started to ask myself, I, I said, you know, is this intellectually and spiritually honest or is this lazy? Well, I came to the conclusion that it was quite intellectually lazy to completely ignore over a thousand years of church history and to just say, I follow Jesus, bro, um, didn't really make much sense to me. So upon reading the church fathers, reading about church history, you know, I've, it's funny, it reminds me of a conversation I had with you, Will, over a year ago. You're like, I'm going to convert you to Catholicism. <laughs> like, ah. like this guy, no way. But I was like, hey, we always we were always very friendly, even though you used to, you know, you still do dunk on Protestants hard. I find it entertaining. Even as a Protestant, I was like, yeah, I love Will. He's great. But then I finally came around, and then I could no longer reconcile sola scriptura. I could no longer get my head around, um, you know, the whole Reformation. So I figured, okay, you can find the answers to these questions all over YouTube. Um, but I figured, let's just create a place where a lot of people, and we were just talking before we hit record, a lot of people are exiting Protestantism, asking questions, and they run up against a wall when it comes to these particular seven questions. Now, for me. I've somewhat come to the conclusion on the majority of them, but I, as a biased individual, I would say that you guys are the easily the most based Catholics on social media right now. So let's get into these. I think this, this would really bless the audience. So first and foremost, and I think this is like one of the biggest tripping points and stumbling blocks for a lot of people coming into the Roman Catholic faith. So let's jump into it. The first one is how do we explain the Marian dogmas? Wait, Mike, can, is, is order really important to you? I mean, if if you have a if there's a preferential order, I'm I'm open to that for sure. I'm not trying to. I, this is this no, is no, your no. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be. Do it. I just think I think w what has to be started with, if, if order is important to you and you you didn't have your own schematic for it, is sola scriptura. You like okay. we have to start there because it's self contradictory. It, it in four moves. I did this when I was on with Trent Horn debating the Protestant. I forget the guy's name to be honest. Um, everyone does, but, um, <laughs> four moves, it's a, called a, a scholar's checkmate in chess when you beat someone in four moves and sola scriptura falls in four moves. So you, sh you start out by showing Protestants, you love Jesus. Okay. Protestantism is false. The one unifying theme is sola scriptura. So can, can I, can I just take a crack at that one first? Oh, Go dude, absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just so that I don't, I don't want you to think I'm jumpy. Just so Protestants are like, well, I love Jesus, and now you've just shown me Protestantism is false. So that, then we'll start going through and addressing whether or not Catholicism's like weak points or truly weak points or whatever. Okay, so you start four moves, four moves, guaranteed scholars mate in four moves. You have to start out asking, were scriptures books written by a single author? We we say they're. 73 books as Catholics, the one who canonized the Bible. Um, and there are about 35 authors. Protestants say there are a, f a few fewer books and a few fewer authors, but but all within the range. But the point is, all of us, Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, agree that the answer to this first question, were scriptures books written by a single author, is no. There is not a Christian answer. There's not a Christian out there who answers yes. So answer one is no. And the follow-up question is, so since it was multiple authored, the 73-ish books of the Bible, we'll leave aside, 70, 71, 72, 73. Since it was multiple authored, is there a divinely inspired table of contents? 
where where you can know what books for sure belong in the Bible. And everyone knows, well, there's dispute on the matter. So you can't answer yes, and it's simply not in there. So the answer to question two in the scholar's mate is no, there's only one Christian answer. All, all of us disagree about what would be on the table of contents once again, like we said in question number one, but we all agree there is not a table of contents which provides the ground for the dispute. So after you, you answer question two, no, the question becomes, can scriptural inerrancy be known without a promulgation? And the idea here is that um, in order for us to, to agree, all of us agree that Scripture is inerrant. It's not something disputed between Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox. We all say Scripture is inerrant. But for us to be able to know which propositions are inerrant, we'd have to know which books are inerrant. And since we don't all agree on which books are in the Bible, we don't actually agree. We agree about sense, but not reference, to use a philosophical distinction. Now, this isn't baked in. Can scriptural inerrancy be known without promulgation? And the answer here, again, of course, is no. There is no Christian answer constituting yes to question number three. Um, there is no inerrancy without a promulgation. So you have to have a promulgation by some divine author or infallible author at least, if not divine, divine or infallible. So question four, the, the final one is, since, since the answer is no, scriptural inerrancy can't be known without promulgation, um, can an inerrant promulgation be accomplished by a non-infallible promulgator, either God himself or some other infallible institution? And um, the question here once again has only one answer, and it's, it's the answer to the question. You, you can't say yes. Uh, to say yes is actually a, a violation of the principle of proportionate cause, which which is a no-go. That's a first principle. You have to answer no. An inerrant promulgation can't be accomplished without an infallible promulgator. QED, infallible tradition, in an infallible capital T church having tradition is required in order to have inerrant scripture. Those are Four questions, four answers that all Christians agree about. Protestants can't say no to any of these. I used it on an actual Protestant. He, I'm sorry, they couldn't say yes to any of them. He just wanted to, like all Socratic lines of question, wanted to back up after the fourth question was answered. But he was with me on all four questions, all four questions, all four answers. The answers can't be yes. That proves there has to be something called a capital T tradition, which only adhered in the Catholic Church, and for a thousand years, at least, in the Orthodox Church. But you, you can't have Protestantism. So Scriptura is out. That was the most proper dissection of Sola Scriptura I've ever heard. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts, Will and Nick. Start with Will. You know what they'll say, though, when faced with that? It will be the, well, the 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 Bible says that uh, Christ promised me the Holy Spirit to help me read the Bible. Uh, each individual believer is guided by the Holy Spirit. And look where that leads us. Uh, first of all, there was no such promise made to each individual believer. The promise was made to safeguard Christ's church from error. But if each individual believer is guided to interpret Scripture by the Holy Spirit, then they would all interpret it in the same way. But rather obviously, <laughs> infamously, they do not. In fact, we've got 39,000 plus and counting contradictory sects who all disagree about the Bible, despite claiming it. It's just so simple to read. You just pick it up and follow Jesus, bro. And they all disagree about what that means. Yet they each claim to be guided by the Holy Spirit in their interpretation, including the Unitarians who deny the divinity of Christ. So what does this mean then? The Holy Spirit doesn't know his own mind. Truth contradicts truth. Or the Holy Spirit is lying to some of them. So you can reduce the position to absurdity. And it comes back to the logical 
quandary that Tim has outlined that these Protestants are left with. So you, you've got to have the infallible promulgating body. Otherwise, you're left with this ridiculous notion of uh, a fallible list of infallible books so that at any given moment, one book could just, oh, that one's out. Nothing in that was actually infallible after all. Um, or different people interpreting it in different ways. Yeah, the, yeah so the one response that um, the guy, the pro, sorry, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, the Protestant on Trent Horn that I debated came up with was, of course, he will. they will say that if you let them get that far, Will, but I kept backing him up, and I was like, okay, but how do we even have a Bible? And the one response that they're sort of trained to give, it's a canned uh, answer that doesn't mean anything, is they'll just say, you're talking about canonicity. We're talking about inerrancy. And I said, inerrancy and canonicity are mutually constitutive. This means there, there's a mutual constitution between what constitutes the true propositions of the canon and what constitutes the true propositions of uh, all of the words of scripture taken as a whole. In other words, like if I tell you, make a make a left turn i'm giving you directions and i say make a left turn at the quijibo and trust me this is inherently true you're like yes it's inherently true but part of me knowing it inherently is i have to know what a quijibo is so um you, you it doesn't work for them to just say okay you guys say the bible has 73 books we say the bible has let's say they only said it had 10. No, no one says that it has that few, but let's say they only had said it had 10. It's like, well, then we don't agree about what constitutes inerrant scripture. Really, if there's a word of difference, then we're talking about different substances. If we were to run a, an oozeology on the, the whole matter. And so you have to agree about what scripture is. And so what I, what I was doing with the scholars mate there is using what they call canonicity. They try to prescind. They try to excise it from the matter because they know they're in trouble there and prove from the fact that there's only one institution that canonized scripture um, to, to make the, the case. So it's all about who wrote and published and, and promulgated scripture as infallible. And they, they, they can never get off the hook there. And that's why they couldn't answer yes to any of the four questions. They had to keep moving the uh, Socratic line of questions moving. But yet, once, once, if you let them, if you make the mistake the way Catholics often will. Well, I told Trent, Catholics make mistakes when they di uh, dialogue, debate with Protestants. They let them off the canonicity thing. You can't do that. You can't do that because then it makes their arguments look more valid. It's not scripture, except in some equivocal sense. Um, if you take book one and it's got 73 books and book two and it has 72 chapters, that's not the, that's not the same substance. So don't let them off canonicity, and then then you can really definitively, satisfyingly, to a logician, prove Protestantism is built on a house of sand. It's actually erroneous. That's well said, Tim. Nick. Yeah, I can't go. I can't go toe to toe with the intelligentsia here uh, when <laughs> when it comes to Tim and Will and their understanding of this. It does make sense to me, but I look at it more forensically because. Uh, yeah, I watched the debate that Tim had with, I think his name was Paul, just for the record, if I remember. It was originally going to be a guy against a guy named Paul, but then he saw the proof and ah. he chickened out. His name was the um, other Paul. And he was oh. like, oh, no. <laughs> and he backed out. <laughs> well, then, I, then forgive me. I don't remember his name either. Um, but I do look at this forensically because given given how robust the the logic is against sola scriptura, then you have to ask like, cui bono? Who, who benefits from democratizing the interpretation of scripture so that each individual can say like, no, this is what it means. And this is what it means. It's like, well, it's the same. It's the non servium. It's Luciferianism. It's self-worship. Mm -hmm. Basically you're, you're turning yourself into the authority of, of Christ's word. And so you're putting yourself above. Christ's word and Protestantism does tend to come back to this like very libertine, uh, culturally American, like nobody can tell me better than I can tell myself way of, of living on this, where you become your own authority. 
And it's a rejection of authority, right? I mean, so everybody right. wants to dog on the Pope, everybody, but they've assigned the title of so Pope to their, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> fair, fair, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. And I think we're all in agreement there, but they want to assign the title of Pope to their pastor at their local church that's down the street from their house. And they don't yeah. see how those things, like you can't dog the Pope and then assign the same title to your pastor um, and and claim that, well, he's guided by the Holy Spirit. So, well, how, I mean, how, how do you know? Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, without even getting into the whole thing, there was one thing about, uh, uh, there was Patrick Madrid. He posed this question. He goes, if I handed you a piece of paper and it said, well, I didn't uh, tell you I stole the money or something along those lines. It was just a phrase. He goes, well, you could phrase this in so many different ways and each individual interpretation would be completely different and the context would be completely different. How do you know what that means and what it says? And so I was kept running into this wall. I wanted to justify Sola Scriptura and I couldn't. And then I realized, I said, okay, so either I'm going to submit to the authority of the church and these thousand plus years of history, or I'm going to believe that Martin Luther and Calvin those two individuals, like they had it all right. These are the only humans, human beings that completes, neg completely negates this thousand plus year history. There's something about that leap that I could not make. And so this leads into the, 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 the next point, because we're talking about uh, infallibility. How do we justify the papacy and the concept of papal primacy and infallibility? Because a lot of times there's this, I was just talking to a good friend of mine yesterday. He goes, but, but, but man is, is fallible. How can the Pope be infallible and will you've explained to, to, to this to me very 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 well how would you explain that to somebody that's really trying to understand the concept of infallibility so they already know something similar when they say that scripture is inerrant right which means that because god is truth with the capital t he can't teach falsehood god isn't gonna teach you something to do with faith and morals that is erroneous and will lead your soul to hell. You can't lie. So they've already grasped the underlying concept of infallibility there as it applies to God mm -hmm. as like the, the supreme teaching authority. So I would just drill down on that. First of all, that they do understand it. Mm -hmm. Now the next bit comes in when you ask, so which is the true church then that actually promulgates this, inerrant divine revelation like if god's the infallible teacher how does that message get across to everyone how does it get spread across the globe how do we proselytize evangelize and you just say is it your church whatever protestant sect it might be does your church claim to be able to teach faith and morals um infallibly or does it admit it can make mistakes and then any Protestant sect has to say, oh, no, it doesn't claim infallibility. Uh, therefore, it's fallible. And it, it could teach me error. And you say, well, maybe it has. Could be any one of the beliefs that it's it's taught you. Um, who knows what might be sending you to hell there? And you look at what the one church that does actually claim infallibility in the full sense of the word, which is the Catholic church. And then you think about the fact that it's logically necessary. If you're going to have this inerrant, this infallible teaching authority, God, we have to have something to promulgate that infallibly on earth. So that's my first response to it. And then St. Augustine had a great line about what you're left with, unless you have that authority. He said, you who believe what you please and reject what you please, believe yourselves or your own fancy rather than the gospel. And that's what Sola Scriptura ultimately boils down to. It's you or your favorite pastor down the street, and you just decide that you guys understand it really well. Or if you're completely batshit crazy, you just end up being like Luther and claiming personal infallibility for yourself. You just decide that's how you want to roll. Yeah, Tim, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. That's all. Genius stuff is always from Will. I would just add, I, I don't like playing the scripture game because it's like being within the Protestant frame. We just showed that that's, that's done forever. Like you can, you can <laughs> slow down the first clip and be like, wow, the scholars mate proves it using um, logical axioms, first principles. So, so there, if you want to be Christian, there's got to be something else. It's either Catholicism or Orthodoxy. Uh, Protestantism is done. It doesn't work. But there are scriptural passages, having said all that, 
that that show that it's at least quite plausible that there's a head bishop and that head bishop is pope um that when when jesus gives the keys of the kingdom to peter waffling peter that tells us a lot um peter's the rock he changes his name this is going to be the, he talks a lot about building your house on rock not on sand peter you know at the end he says you're the rock you know, the the great commission he sends them all out all the apostles become bishops and it's 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 quite clear from the context to anyone looking with an objective eye that that there's a headship to peter the, oh i'll talk about this in a sec but all the first popes called themselves peter or many of them call themselves peter mm -hmm. i am the peter uh you know i'm i'm the equivalent of peter i stand in his place all the other apostles stand in all the other 11's place and then of course just just <laughs> I'll back up one step further with the scriptural proof that there is a power set aside for the apostles qua bishops, because this is we're doing orthodox apologetics when we justify a, a head bishop. We're doing Protestant apologetics when we realize that Protestants don't even have bishops or priests or sacraments. It's so wacky. So you have to first show, I guess, no, Orthodox won't quibble with us here, but like the apostles are a thing you have to have an episcopus and all the apostles get this power this if you will if i'm speaking to a protestant a magic like power of binding and loosing binding sins loosing them in heaven and earth heaven because on earth so there's automatically you have confession and you have the other sacraments besides and this is given only to a special sacerdotal class um or an episcopal class um, of which the sacerdotal class is a subset. So there's there's bishops. There's something special about the bishop Peter. And then when you look at the very, very first bishops and popes of the church, what do you see? They're, um, them calling the head pope Peter. He's a Peter, even though there was never another Peter. That's actually in prophecy. If there's another Peter who sits on the throne of Peter, it's supposed to be a sign of end times. But um, they're all saying that also in the second, I always forget if it's the second or the fourth pope, he sends a letter exercising a universal jurisdiction um, over all the other bishops. This is very, very early on. Even the, I don't know, wackiest Protestant out there doesn't say that the church had gone corrupt by the second or the fourth pope. I, I'm just forgetting this morning. Um, exercising universal jurisdiction, which is this power whereby it very clearly shows that uh, there is a head bishop who can tell all the other bishops, do this in your diocese, particularly with disciplines of the faith, like tell all your priests to wear the tonsure, wear their hair in the tonsure. This this happened as early as, um, you know, one of the first five popes besides Peter. So, but now then when it comes to infallibility, which is a more nuanced question, we know that um, now we're doing kind of Catholic apologetics, responding to Catholics who, who get this wrong. The Pope is not infallible in almost anything he does. There are estimates of only two infallible acts by Popes in 2,000 years. You average them out, and that's only one every 1,000 years. Some people say it's more like five or six, that um, three or four additional acts of various Popes over the last two millennium count. But the point is, in Scripture, in Acts, you see Paul correcting Peter. This is the role of the bishops, later the cardinals. That's a development of special bishops that are a special college of counsel to the Pope. But you see it in Acts. So for the hyper-papalists out there, which, which I am not, as anyone watching will tell you, yeah, the Pope is a special bishop. He does have a universal jurisdiction. He does have an extra charism of infallibility only when he invokes it and we get the gloss for how he what he has to say to invoke it from vatican one from one of the two constitutions of vatican one which is very recent and if you read that document carefully the vatican one document carefully that out outlines the very few times when a pope can speak an infallible truth into existence or rather speak its security into existence um you realize that really this has only ever been done twice, both both with the uh, Marian dogmas, with the third and fourth Marian dogma, which we're going to talk about. And basically it never happens. So we've had 266 popes and only two of them, arguably only two, have ever 
made an infallible claim. The rest of the time, the Pope's the Pope's fallible. Um, it gets a little tricky when you ask what do Catholics have to do when the Pope is saying something wrong until he dies. That's a trickier question, but it's not altogether important for this discussion. Um, it's just important to say he has a universal jurisdiction. It was exercised in like the first 50 years of the pontificate after Jesus died. Um, there are bishops. They're the ones with powers of binding and loosing. They create the priestly class. And um, that head bishop can tell all the other bishops what to do and can very, very rarely, without calling a council, say, you know, this is this is absolutely got all the divine protection of uh, the charism of protection that the whole church vouchsafes normally with councils, ecumenical councils, the Holy Spirit can act through my person if I'm very sure, sure enough to invoke it. So to clarify again, before we get to Nick's point, just for people, because that that was just all beautifully said, it's only when a, a pope is making a, a, a statement ex cathedra, right? on doctrine, on morals, on any, all it's many different things have to line up, right. In order for that to be considered infallible word, right. Because the, the, the conflation that's being made here is that, oh, he's, he's infallible that you're telling me that Pope Francis is infallible. It's like, no, 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 no. And, and you also explain, and this is something I didn't know until somewhat recently, there's only two instances where you just mentioned about the Marian dogmas where, um, the Pope spoke infallibly. So like there's an important distinction and I don't think that's really talked about enough because people keep running into this wall of infallibility. It's like, no, it's not about the person. It's about the teaching, the Holy Spirit, the magisterium, tradition, scripture, right. all of these things lining up in order to make this statement, um, an infallible right. statement. Uh, yeah, I'll let, I'll let Nick get to his part in a second, but there's a reason why, you know, atheists say like most religious people are stupid. The thing is they're right. It's just a hundred percent of atheists are stupid and wrong. Just ninety nine percent of religious people are stupid and wrong. So, yeah. Um, so yet yeah, even Catholics have the right point of view, and so many of them are stupid. They absorb the Protestant caricature of Papists, and they're like, "You guys worship the Pope." And so many Catholics have been like, "Yeah, maybe we do. That's cool because he's <laughs> because he's got all of these powers." I just adumbrated. They're like, yeah, he, yeah, we kind of do. And it's like, no, 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 we don't. It's yes, Francis could invoke, and this is the greatest proof text of all. Someone that I, I, I think is an evil man, like Francis. We've had other evil men sit on the throne, by the way. Um, it's not often, but we've we've had a few. He could invoke his in, infallible charism and speak some falsity into existence. He's he he doesn't want to though because he knows immediately um, there would be a retroactive provision which we all also have and we'd be like well this proves he was never pope there's there's some reasonable doubt as to whether or not he was ever pope if he just used an ex cathedra claim to do one of the w e f friendly things that he wants to do like communion for the divorce and remarried or, or um, SS civil unions or women deacons or intercommunion with the Lutherans, any of this shit, then if he did that ex cathedra, everyone would say, oh, he's definitely an anti-pope. So he has to move slowly. There are other protections besides, but the point is really, really clear and it needs to be made really clearly. Yeah, we've had only two out of two. I mean, some people say three, four, five. You can debate whether it was there in an ecumenical council first, but really only two very clear, undisputed exercises of the ex cathedra uh, infallibility power of popes in 2000 years, in 266 popes. We, we don't worship the pope. His job, he is the chief servant, right? He's the servant of servants. Um, here on earth is just to vouchsafe the one gospel and keep it from changing teaching. And Jesus says this all over the place. Jesus does say to some of these hyper papalists very clearly, if and, and Paul repeats it, if somebody presents a false gospel to you that that all that, that differs from the true gospel, you know him as a false teacher. And this this doesn't exclude popes. So a pope can theoretically be a false teacher without being an ex-cathedra 
infallible false teacher. And this has happened, I believe, with lots of popes, but definitely with Francis, where the, he's tried to sort of insinuate false teachings, but he's never said it's infallible. That's This begins to address, well, how do you guys, maybe, okay, you just proved that uh, sola scriptura is false, but how do you guys stand by Catholicism? Why not orthodoxy where we don't have to deal with a pope? We get all the goodies, sacraments, bishops, priests, a, a view of history that's not embarrassing the way it is for Protestants. You know, the religions, you know, orthodoxy is 2,000 years old. That's true. Um, Protestantism is a man-made book club that's 500 years old. But <laughs> why, why, why Catholicism over orthodoxy? It's like, well, because you still need the Pope, even if we have a bad one. We never said that we didn't have bad ones. And I'm just showing that the papacy survives Francis. The papacy survived John the 15th. The papacy from, survived the Borgias. It's not about the person, like you just said, Mike. It's about preserving doctrine. And orthodoxy has not done that. Actually, all of Francis's bad stuff that he's done has been lifted from orthodoxy with regard to um, pornea, se sexual teaching, communion for the divorce and civilly remarried, which we've protected against Francis, came from orthodoxy. And, and same thing with um, contraception. They, they have contraception, and no Christian did before 1930. So, so we've protected against doctrine. The Orthodox have not, even though we have bad popes from time to time. And that's a big part of the reason why I am not Orthodox. Will, go ahead, and then Nick. People watching, Tim just said it. This book, The Bad Popes by E.R. Chamberlain, you can grab a copy on Amazon, read it, and it'll give you a sense of what Tim's talking about there, that you can have evil men sitting in Peter's seat, but they're still not going to be able to bind the faithful to error when authoritatively defining faith and morals. And that's one of the strongest proofs of infallibility. It's exactly what Tim was talking about there. And that whole book gives you some really rich, exciting examples of some of the characters who in some ways, you know, people debate this, in some ways, maybe not overall, they're worse than Francis. So just get that sense of historical perspective and remember that the church is thinking in terms of thousands of years, not just the ups and downs of a decade here and there. And that helps people to chill out a bit, in my experience, when they take the long view. Well said. And Nick? It's uh, a hard, hard evidence that Will's bookshelf isn't a prop. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. how he got that big, beautiful brain, clearly. Uh, it's just a screen. There's barbells behind it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, to to put to put Will's uh, recollection to the test, Will, as an intro to my point, do you know to whom G.K. Chesterton attributes his faith in God? Oh, no, I don't actually. Who was it? <laughs> Satan. Hmm. And I think I share in that, uh, that but ironically, the most active agent in my return to Catholicism has been Satan. And largely, uh, it started many, many years ago. Um, it's actually about halfway through that journey where I met Tim filming for the film The Greatest Reset. And the, the origin of this this question was the, the infallibility of the Catholic Church. And then we transitioned into the more specific question of the Pope. But uh, I'm, I think I'm on record on at least one podcast and then definitely in person during my years of atheism saying like, yeah, I, I, there's a chance I might come back to a faith in God, but it will never be Catholicism. I was adamant about that. I was like, that one's just beyond the pale. Like the, those those guys are have truly lost the plot and then i embarked on a more focused career interacting with evil uh, made a film about child sex trafficking made a film investigating the world economic forum satanic ritual abuse um, free masonic things this is where tim and i uh started our friendship was on the question of the alta vendita and the, we started the our friendship with freemasonry with freemasonry <laughs> yes. uh -oh. at, at the lodge together um you know the <laughs> the masonic infiltration of the catholic church and the theme that i kept running into over and over and over again is that the that satan is not concerned with any 
church except for the Catholic church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can arrive at the truth of Catholicism through affirmations of, of logic and history and so on. Or you can go the much scarier route and come in direct contact with Satan and what he's done in the world. And that's what I did. And uh, there is only one antithesis to it, and that's the Catholic Church. And you will not find any other bastion. I like that, Nick. That uh, kind of, um, I don't know why this reminds me of, I um, when I moved here to this province in the end of 2000, well, I came here in the summer of 2022, but I got re-baptized. So I've been, I was baptized in the Catholic Church and then got baptized in the Protestant Church. And then the 12 months after that, was the worst 12 months of my entire life. We're talking demonic dreams. And it was it just in my life. It, it, it took a turn for the worst. And I used to think that, um, okay, that it's because I'm on the side of truth that this is happening and the devil's coming at me for a reason. Uh, when really it could have been actually the opposite. I was so far away from the truth and I was believing a lie until I came to just like just past a year, that year point, the the the, the you know, anniversary of the, the the baptism, that I started to have these revelations of the Catholic Church. So it's it's just it's it's interesting that encounter with Satan, and it can take many different forms, and it's making me reflect. I'm like maybe that actually was because I was going too far the other direction. Because after that, when people would bring up Catholicism, I I, I was so violent in my um, opposition to it to a point where it didn't really make any sense and i had no justification or rebuttals for it it was just emotion uh, it's interesting we'll we'll chat after yeah definitely okay so i mean on this topic of like the the you know infallibility we might as well skip to this this question here so how do we <laughs> you guys said it too when i came on my first episode that i'm entering the catholic church at an interesting time with uh papa francesco being the vicar of rome how do we reconcile Pope Francis as our leader? How do we, when somebody says, yeah, but you're Pope, we got to respect him. Maybe, maybe not. But how do we, how do we approach that conversation? It was even hard for me to frame it. Cause I'm like, I don't like him. None of us really like him. There's Pope splainers. There's people that believe that he's not actually a Pope. How do we, how do we reconcile this? How do we explain or justify? Yeah. Pope Francis to people. Can I just jump in at the, at the start here? Cause I know, the, yeah, yeah. The, the academics are going to have a, a robust logical answer, mm. but as a non-academic who came back into the church within the Francis pontificate, um, I would just, I would just say that it was quite irrelevant to me. It Same. never, never once made it into my calculations. Same. There was 19, 1890 years of Catholicism where almost every Catholic didn't know what the hell was going on in Rome or what the Pope was thinking or doing or which hand he used to wipe his ass every morning. <laughs> and uh, those Catholics had every chance that you and I have to live a faithful life and go to heaven and become saints. So Francis is a scourge on, I would say, non-believers more than believers. Agreed. But on on both accounts, he is a bit of a red herring, and it's an it's an unfortunate, <laughs> tragic, legitimate red herring. But you don't need to understand what the hell Francis is doing to become Catholic in good faith with with full application of your will and go to heaven. Beautifully said, Will. A lot of it has already been implied, especially in Tim's answers, that the, the church needs a, a head as a, a a visible church, an earthly institution, mixed with the divine, obviously, but as an earthly institution, the church as a hierarchy must have a head. You've got one fold, one flock, um, under one shepherd, and you've got to have a leader. And one of the really great things about Tim's book, Case for Patriarchy, is that it draws a parallel between the household, the domestic patriarchy, and the broader patriarchy of the church as a whole. And just as a household has a father, and all the Protestants, it's a good thing in a way, 
are getting more and more interested, I think, in the concept of patriarchy and male leadership within the home. But if you extend that out and think about Christianity as a whole, you, you're expecting the church to not have a father. And you can have a, a bad father of a family. I mean, every earthly father is sinful, right? Me included, Tim included, all the guys you can think of included. We're imperfect, but we still have that seat of authority within the household. And it's the same thing with Francis too. Only we get that level of infallibility added in because that's what it has to be the case logically for Christ's church to be the pillar and ground of truth, as scripture says. Like no matter who is there in the chair, it's still going to be the pillar of truth until the end of time. Beautifully said. Timothy J. Gordon, what are your thoughts? Folks don't need to understand what Francis's program is, but it's also, there's a, a pure desire to know, as uh, Vatican II father Bernard Lonergan says in his book, Insight. And so it's it's there's a natural curiosity there. This guy seems so bad. How can he be good? Well, the question is, he he seems bad, and I, I, he is bad. He was in place there by a group called the Sankt Gallen Mafia, which in over the last two generations um, seemed to be the personnel of a 150-year-old cadre that's always had a, a kind of Sankt Gallen Mafia through the generations over the last six or seven generations. And this mafia... Um, once circulated in the middle 1800s, a document called the Permanent Instruction of the Alta Vendita that was intercepted by the Cardinal Secretary of State of Pope Pius VIII, we believe it is, through, um, I was researching this to write a book on it. Taylor Marshall thought it was uh, happened about 10 years later, but we, we found some extra research. Pope Pius VIII in the early 19th century intercepted this document, it got passed around, and what it was was an um, intricate plan by a P2 Lodge, a lodge of basically Freemasons, that said, look, the, the, one, the one true faith is Catholicism. It basically affirms this, for, for starters. This is, the, these are, this is the enemy. We worship Lucifer. The enemy is the one true form of the one true faith, Christianity. And we have to surround the Pope with ideas that are Freemasonic, even if the Pope doesn't enter our lodges. It says this very specifically. Now, in order to surround him, we have to get many cardinals around him who are actually Freemasons. And this means we need to infiltrate the seminaries. These seminaries do not vet with the background check power of the CIA or NSA or something. So and they didn't use all these terms. I'm just breaking it down. So over the next hundred years, the soldier will die and the fight will carry on. It's a direct famous line from the Alta Vendita. And it will take us uh, about this amount of time to infiltrate the pontificate. Well, by the end of the 18th century, you have um, Pope Leo XIII, my, my personal favorite pope of all time, intellectually and uh, faithfully, saying all around there are people that are trying to infiltrate the seminaries and uh, the episcopate. And Pius X, 10 years later, will say the same thing in the starting years of the 20th century. There are people, there are infiltrators everywhere that are trying to get in. We've never had this problem before. The Alta Vendita also says, attacks outside the faith, the Roman Catholic faith, don't work. The, the French Revolution made the faith stronger. All of uh, Nero's and, and Hadrian's torture devices and, and lion feedings in the Colosseum only grew the ranks of the martyrs. What, what's up with that? Well, with the one true faith, there's only one way you can be effective and attack it, and it's through infiltration. And so when you look at the beginning of the history of the um, Sankt Gallen Mafia, and not a conspiracy theory, there, there are cardinals alive today who admit to being in it, they talk about what happened at the last two conclaves. That's where cardinals elect the Pope. At 2005, Francis just admitted this in chapter three of his new book, which comes out this week. He gave a preview chapter and he said, yeah, there was this skullduggery and it was by these guys. He doesn't name them, but it's the Sancto Alla Mafia. That's the 2005 conclave, which gave us Benedict. There were uh, people 
putting him forward, even though he was an unknown, he came second in the voting and they said, we're going to prop you up and, and um, essentially work a deal. Uh, this is a transitional papacy, they said about Benedict the Sixteenth. I remember that article coming out in Time magazine, a transitional papacy. That's because there are powers, dark powers that were acting, Sankt Gallen powers, Alta Vendita powers, to get this man in. And they've been plotting for this for about 150 years. And that is Francis. Whether he knows it or not, the Alta Vendita leaves it unclear. Does he know he's doing the bidding of the Freemasons? Maybe, maybe not. But the point is that, that like, like Will said, fatherhood survives bad fathers. The pontificate survives ba bad pontiffs. The need for a pontiff is sorely there. Like Will, uh, like Nick said, um, if you have firm faith, they're just like, the Pope is just there. He's just a placeholder. Keep doctrine from changing. Yeah. It, he's been a scourge on unbelievers because there haven't been that many converts under Francis. Thank goodness for both of you two. You both came back into the faith. They're both technically reverts, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But to the extent that he hasn't been able to stop you and those like you from coming back in, it proves we need a pontificate, but not this pontiff. There, are, We need fatherhood, but not uh, Pap Finn. That's, that's, all, that's all that Francis does. It's a red herring. Yeah, that's that's beautifully said, and and honestly, I, the same thing as Nick. It, it, it was it. I didn't care if it was that was, it was Pope Francis sitting on the chair. I, I it, it it was completely irrelevant to me. In fact, actually, it's it was further convincing to me that there was a concerted attack on the truth, and a concerted attack on the church from the inside. So, in a kind of a roundabout way, it justified my reversion. Because mm -hmm. I said, "Hey, look, look, look at this. This guy is making a mockery of our faith." Everybody's pointing and seeing, oh, this is the leader of, 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 you know, the Roman Catholic Church. How can it be real? I said, yeah, because um, the enemy has no concern with Protestantism because it's 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 nothing. Also, you know, it's my, nothing. I know I've been prolix but, today, but this is really, really profound. The enemies of the church who infiltrated, um, one of which is Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, six months after Francis came in, McCarrick was bragging at Villanova University in late 2013. And he said, look, I was part of the, the cadre that arranged this. I was part of the St. Gallen Mafia. And um, I told everybody, he's bragging. I told, I told my friends, I told this mysterious Italian gentleman he never names, powerful gentleman that helped me arrange for Bergoglio to become Francis I. It was originally supposed to be this other Cardinal Martini was going to be Francis I, their leader of the St. Gallen Mafia, but he got saved. He said, give me, give, give, let us give this guy Bergoglio four or five years and he'll remake the church. Now mm. we are beginning the 12th year of Francis's pontificate. He has famously expressed frustration over the, the trads and those who are stalling up the faith. The, the greater point is this, you made one point from the perspective of Protestants. Protestantism is never attacked because it's wrong in its own right. The Catholic Church is attacked because it's true, but also, even though it's attacked and it's been attacked from within, which I identified as a more effective mode of attack than an exterior attack, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it still can't be infiltrated to the core because whenever a dogma or a de fide teaching, an irreformable teaching, is threatened, we've had this several times in the past, the Pope will either die the night before he has plans to do so, or he will be thwarted. He'll have to undo what he did, Francis named Heiner Wilmer, the leader of the German Synodal Way, revolutionary, as he was about to do it twice, name him as the doctrinal chief of the church twice, and it got mysteriously overturned. Even Francis can't do it. All of his tireless, tireless labor toward uh, female deacons was supposed to happen at the Amazon Synod in October of 2019. He had to kick it back. This synod, the Synod on Synodality, was supposed to last a year and a half. He just extended it into uh, early 2026. He extended it <laughs> six months ago. He keeps having to extend it. So McCarrick and the champions of Francis said, give him five years, he'll remake the whole church. He can't do it. He's not going to be able to do it. He, Francis, because even when you get your guy in the chair who can hit the nuclear button, no one's there to stop him from doing it. He can't do it. It's protected by heaven. There's no goalkeeper. 
he can't make the goal. Chills, Tim. It's, it's powerful. Yeah, it's Chills. good stuff. It's amazing. If Ron just, Howard and yeah. Dan Brown had like any actual catechesis or like talk to you, that would have been that's the wild. Da Vinci Code. That would have been like <laughs> the greatest Catholic movie of all. That's what I thought I was getting to watch when I watched the Da Vinci Code. And it was like just a shitty national treasure about like a painting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, National treasure is fun. The Da Vinci Code just sucked. It's so bad. But what you just said was like, that's electrified. Just looking at, okay, taking another completely alternative route here just look at it narratively what more exciting story could you expect from like the true like you don't get that level of drama and narrative from from something that isn't true that's powers and right. principalities that's real exciting stuff that gave me chills will you're going to say something i was just going to say the the image that christ used of his church being like a net that contains good and bad fish what were you expecting? People <laughs> saying, oh, there's bad fish in the net. Yeah, we know. Of course. It doesn't mean you do what the reformers did, which is say that the net is broken and you have to make your own because you haven't got any authority to do that. So you should expect to see bad stuff in the church because it's both a divine and human institution. And the human element is always going to be a mixture of good and evil. So it, it, would ne it was never going to be any other way. And it shouldn't shock people. You know, I find it also very telling whenever, you know, uh, Catholicism is mentioned on any of my social media platforms, like the attack that I get. But then when you mention orthodoxy, it doesn't get as quite the same level of response. No, orthodoxy is base, of, bro. Look at their beards. Yeah, online orthodoxy, <laughs> I'll, I'll say in their defense, is completely different from actual orthodoxy. There's like a, such a departure there. Like, it's such a meme online. But there's almost like a cold indifference towards orthodoxy. And then there's all this emotion from Protestants and then this attack on Roman Catholics. And that 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 tells you a lot. And I tells can say humbly, you know. yeah, yeah, well, that's it. And it's so clear, man. It's so clear if you're looking at it logically. But a lot of people are not. They're looking at it completely emotionally. And that's why Pope Francis is preventing them from um, – living and experiencing the, the the fullness of the truth uh, guys like this was this is some of the best stuff i've ever heard so i mean i knew this is why i had to bring this forward now to kind of take a step to a, a, a different direction this is definitely going to be multiple parts here by the way um the marian dogmas we were going to originally start with this tim i'm glad you chimed in and we started with sola scriptura that was that was great how do we explain the marian dogmas how do we explain like that veneration of Mary, the Hail Mary? We, I mean, we 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 all know because that's the that's the Protestant th trope, right? It's like you guys worship Mary. It's like no 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 no. It's not worship. How would you start that conversation? First, point out that the Church teaches that it would be a mortal sin for any Catholic to worship Mary as a goddess. Mm -hmm. So, where did Protestants get the idea that? Mary is venerated as divine. Like most Protestant objections to Catholicism, it's not actually church teaching. I struggle with this sometimes. You have to be sympathetic and remember that the version of Catholicism that they hate with such passion doesn't exist in the real world. Mm -hmm. It's just something they're walking around with in their imaginations. So go back to basics with church teaching. Mary is not a goddess the church doesn't say that nick uh, or, go, or go ahead tim if you if you had something ready go ahead you want to go yeah, nick go ahead. no go ahead tim let's, let's pull tonight the sword fight. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we do a very we do a damn good job of not doing politeness sword fights on this show because people no, don't you go tim you go you go no I you, love you more. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> speaking of politeness sword fights i will say i have a lot of ortho bro friends online um i get the the draw to orthodoxy simplicitaire and particularly orthodoxy online because they kind of have they ostensibly have the best of both worlds they have bishops mm -hmm. sacraments priests tradition benedict says we can call them a real church they have history they know what an ecumenical council is. They have those sweet, sweet beards, like Nick says. <laughs> it's a cool aesthetic, and they've maintained online. The ortho bros have maintained their manliness, unlike That's Roman true. Catholicism, which is run by these shriveled. Actually, they're not always shriveled. A lot of times they're young, and they seem like fair maidens, but they're 
cackling at everyone. And they're like, I'm a faithful Catholic. I went to Franciscan, but men need to shut up. It's, <laughs> it's horrible. They watch Cabrini look. and they think it was a good movie. They watch right? Cabrini. They think it's a good movie. <laughs> Ortho Bros watch that and they're like, what? Like, this That's is so awful. true. So, so, so I get it. It just turns out they're wrong. I do like Ortho Bros, though. And so I. I, I find I get their appeal. And only um, smarty pants like Mike and Nick see through the very appealing appeal of orthodoxy, which is much more intellectually serious than Protestantism, and yeah. still come back to Catholicism, which gets all the hatred. We got we get called the pedos, we get called the skittles, we get and, and a lot of it's been deserved. But um, it's because of the infiltration, because we're the one for true faith. Now, having said that, I don't, I'm not as sympathetic to the Mary stuff. Um, okay, so take take the Marian dogma, start with mother of God. Um, a lot of, not all Protestants don't want her to be the mother of God. Well, she's the mother of Jesus, but not, but not of God. The Theotokos means mother of God. Um, yes, she is. And this, again, goes back to the fourth ecumenical council. You are heretics, Protestants, who say Mary's not the mother of God, specifically your Nestorians. Mm -hmm. um, and Nestorianism is the fourth ecumenical, or is it the fifth? The fourth ecumenical council's heresy that it anathematized there, um, saying that Jesus's two natures couldn't be split. Remember from Arianism, the first heresy at the first ecumenical council said Jesus is more man than God, so he's not part of the Trinity. Then you add kind of uh, at the second ecumenical council, sort of an overreaction saying Jesus is more God than man. The monophysites said that, and that was wrong. He's not more God than man. He's equally God and man. Then the third ecumenical council, they're, they're, they keep trying to course correct. It's honest mistake at the beginning of the church, the third council. And then they said, okay, he's God and man, but he has a separate nature, a separate mind from uh, the person or something like that. That's that's Apollinarianism. And then you get to Nestorianism, which said, okay, well, he had he had like two natures in one. They're getting closer to the truth, by the way. He had two natures in one, but they were divisible, his two natures. And Nestorianism is called a heresy. And he, he has two natures and they're indivisible. They're inseparable in his person. What the heck? We can't fully understand it. But specifically, Nestorianism came about by folks saying that Mary was the mother of Jesus, but not the mother of God. This is the inception of that fourth heresy to, to, to say precisely what, I don't know, Ali Beth Stuckey and, and, and um, know nothing Protestants like that today say. Jesus was, Mary was the mother of Jesus, but not of God. No, the splits is inseparable natures by definition, because Mary would be the Jesus mother, not the, the God mother. It doesn't work. He has only, he has two natures in one person, but they're inseparable natures. That means Mary, because of our Christology, follows our Mariology. Um, Mary must be the mother of God, the Theotokos, just based off Christology. And this is the way that all the other questions, the other three Marian dogmas follow. Mariology always is a bottom line concept, not a precept. Christology is our precept because we do worship Jesus as the second person in the Holy Trinity. He's the precept. And then you just follow the math. This is what Catholicism is all about. It's doing history correctly and doing the math correctly. And you're like, oh, okay, Mary must be the mother of God, even though that's a lot. And then you get the weird hatred from Protestants. That doesn't make sense. Even if you think she's just the mother of Jesus, well, still, that's why we venerate her. I, I've never understood that one. Like we, we, we don't, we, we can ask her to pray for us. That's all saying a Hail Mary is. Can, do Protestants think it's bad to ask fellow Christians to pray for them? Well, what about extra holy ones who, I don't know, are the mother of God? Do you think her prayers might count a little extra? I think so. So that's that's mother of God. Um, I would just say to a bunch of the other stuff, because I don't use the sola scriptura frame because we, we proved that's wrong at the outset, remember? Um, I would just say, look at the science. Look at the tilma of Guadalupe. It will blow your mind. The thing is always 98.6 degrees. The thing, the So the, the paint, and, and Protestants don't know this. Atheists don't know this. Mary gave this miraculous tilma to Juan Diego uh, right after the Protestant Reformation, seemed to be a response to it in Mexico. The color is non-elemental in the, the, the tilma. 
So it hovers three tenths of a millimeter above the substrate. You could look at it from the side and the color, the color is not on the tilma's matter itself. It hovers miraculously. It's not an element. What the hell is that? Um, if you pass a stethoscope over the heartbeat, over the heart, it has a heartbeat. If you look at the eyes, which appear to be closed, there are four different figures that are reflected in her eyes. The, the eyes appear to be closed, but if you look at them, there's a reflection of Juan Diego standing there, of his bishop and two other individuals. That This is impossible. They did not have like 3D printers back then. Also, even if they had 3D printers back then, the colors, as I said before, are not on the tilma. It's got a heartbeat. It's always 98.6 degrees. There are so many other miraculous properties of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And what was that? Who was that? That was Mary, the mother of God, who made the, ma the, the largest single mass conversion event to Christianity in history, like 8 million Mayans and, or Incans or whatever the hell they were. And it, it was all basically at once, and it was a response, or some say, to, to, to uh, make up zero sum for the 8 million or so Protestants who left at the Reformation. But um, that's just a little bit of that. That applies to the other three Marian dogmas. I'm sure Will and Nick want to say some about those. I'm just saying we don't have to only use scripture because that's a, a Protestant error that we've already misproven. We can use Fatima, Lourdes, Guadalupe, all of the other Marian apparitions are some of the most amazing things. Our Lady of Zatun, Egypt. We have pictures of her appearing at this little. Uh, at this little chapel where Jesus, Mary, and Joseph stayed in Egypt. It's all very, very real, and the science proves that it's very, very real. You can go see the tilma today. Or you can just uh, ignore it all and then end up denying the Trinity. <laughs> that's that's the other option. <laughs> <laughs> Choose your pill. <laughs> the only thing I'll add is that everything that I said about the... Uh, Satan's hatred of the Catholic Church is writ large with regard to Mary. Uh, it's a hundredfold. There seems to be a unique, asymmetric mm -hmm. hatred of Mary by everything yep. demonic. The Protestant response to the Marian dogmas is exemplary of that. It's It's an inexplicable, irrational, vitriol spitting venomous vitriol that comes from protestantism toward these propositions about mary it's unreasonable why couldn't it be this way why couldn't the creator of the universe who who penned this this story this romance between his creation and himself choose for things to transpire this way it's not idolatry that that has been addressed, and it's addressed immediately, Will said, the Catholic Church itself says this is a mortal sin, this is not idolatry, the actual term is hyperdulia. So what, where is this coming from? She crushes the head of the serpent, and she is the mediatrix, uh, and she's also the one who facilitates uh, exorcisms and the expulsion of demons. And so if there is this irrational hatred, uh, I see that as substantial evidence of of the truth of the claims about the Marian dogmas. And uh, I had a Twitter mutual who was posting about the Tilma and said that it had to have been a demonic creation. Some demonic superintelligence had to have created the phenomena of the Tilma. Like the lengths that, that they will a go to, leap of faith. It does the, yeah. the lengths that they will go to to refuse Mary her place as Queen of Heaven and in this narrative is extraordinary. And I believe that the only the only explanation can't be rational. It's not even the hardest one. Like there are harder theological uh, or philosophical hurdles to get over. Yeah. In in the question of you know which church is the right church. Or whatever. This is not hard. It's 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 a it's an interesting narrative piece that 
you should be able to find all of the justification readily available and then go, oh, all right, I guess that's true. So and why people, not? People don't talk about Genesis 315 enough in connection no. with this. Remember the verse, uh, God says to Satan, I will put enmities between thee and the woman. Thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. Now, um, had Mary contracted original sin, then she would have been under the dominion of Satan. So this is why the Immaculate Conception is so important, because he never gets his claws into her at all. And then you can even think about it with the uh, assumption as well. When Christ doesn't allow her body to suffer corruption, it's the same thing. Tim didn't, <clears throat> Aquinas wasn't uh, sure on the Immaculate Conception. He didn't think you could you know, prove it logically. Um, I think the, the most that the theologians said before it was formally defined as a dogma is that, you know, it, it was, it's fitting. Like it, it was fitting that it was so, because obviously Christ could have chosen to incarnate um, any way he chose, but it was to actually um, honor matter in a way, honor matter and be, be fully human and go through the same process as us, that this was the fitting process. And then the Immaculate Conception is, is the best way to get it done, but not logically necessary, right? Precisely. Yeah. Theologians before that were half, half, but Aquinas ends up saying, look, I'll accept it in faith because even though it was not yet a dogma, this ironically was the immaculate conception and the assumption that were the only two ex cathedra statements by popes, which proves another principle that popes will only ex cathedra eyes something that's already been in Catholic tradition for 2000 years. They won't make something up. Most of the theolo half or more of the theologians had already accepted it in Aquinas by, say, the late 1100s. Like Will just said, was like, well, people are saying that she was an immaculate conception. It's fitting. It makes sense that she would have to be immaculate in order to be the um, the new Ark of the Covenant, which is one of her titles, or to be the new Eve who undoes, you know, the 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 curses of Eve with the 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 blessings of Mary. So it's fitting, and um, most theologians um, between Aquinas and the actual announcement of this in the 18th or 19th centuries um, had already come to accept, and the Pope just formalized it. It's equal, like you, like Will just insinuated, it's fitting that she would be assumed into heaven, body, or soul. I could go either way on the Dormition, whether she was said to have died or fallen asleep. If she didn't, if she wasn't tainted by original sin, her body and soul go straight to heaven. We are tainted by original sin, so we have our particular judgment first, where our soul goes without our body, so we're not personal, we're not personal entities, until the general judgment at the end of time when we'll get our bodies back. Mary never had to go through that. So it's fitting, That's a and those are the two Marian dogmas, so the easy uh, two Marian dogmas that correspond with the only two ex cathedra papal claims. So the easy way to prove this, Will proved it the smart way, that immaculate conception and assumption are not silly. The easy way to go at this point is to say, well, because an ex cathedra papal claim um, stated them, and we know those are good. Um, so yeah, that's great stuff. Does anyone want to address perpetual virginity? This is the only easy Protestant pitfall, but it's only because you guys have been lied to, Protestants. But I, I this is the only one I understand. When you read the Bible and you see that Jesus had brothers, well, of course you're going to question it. You just you just got lied to by a translator. Yeah, hmm. cousins. They, cousins. Go ahead. They're cousins. They just lied to you because Protestantism is a, a lie for people that don't understand how history or family trees work. So the, the the lie there was in the word brother. Was it an improper translation of what the original language is? What you're saying? Yeah, which yeah. meant. Cousins, because that same yeah, word is used elsewhere. And they do that as well when um, full of grace is just translated, which is to say interpreted as highly favored. And this mm -hmm. is why you can't actually read any translation of the Bible that isn't approved by the Catholic Church, because translation is interpretation. Right. I Oh, oh yeah. Full of, by the way, thank you, Will. Yeah, full of Lleno grace. Yeah, <laughs> 
plena grazia. Yeah, is the way that you prove that Mary is the closest thing to a proof text for the Immaculate Conception, aside from just, uh, you know, Pius told us this ex cathedra and it's fitting. Well, yeah, plena grazia. It means literally, if I'm, you know, I do, I do love words. It means filled by grace. And to be filled by grace requires that you are not tainted by any sin to be filled by 100% grace. No human being who uh, suffers the taint of the fall can be filled by grace. Even the greatest saints aside from her, the second greatest saint is St. Joseph. The first greatest saint is Mary. What gives her the lead? She strictly, just as a matter of like Mega Man error, error or, or energy bars, she has 100% energy on the lack of um, being touched by sin, maculated. So she must be immaculate at that point. And because she's immaculate, then she'll be assumed. Now, I will say there was supposed to be a fifth Marian dogma announced at Vatican II. Uh, John the Twenty Third once again, um, screwed the pooch. Uh, they say in the footnotes of one of the documents, they're supposed to announce the uh, mediatrix of all graces, co-redemptrix, and it literally says, I forget which constitution it is in the footnote. This would be alienated, further alienating to Protestants. And this is not the goal of this fruity council. You know, 20, 20, that was the job of the first 20 out of 20 to air, alienate, further alienate all the heretics with further truth to their error. 21st ecumenical council, we're trying to bring all these heretics back in by softening the truth. So there was supposed to be a fifth Marian dogma. We'll see if it, they get to it. Mediatrix of all graces and, and co-redemptrix. But um, this touches on, I know another one that can go really quick of your questions, Mike, was why, why do we pray to Mary? Why do we pray to any saints? It's just asking your friends to pray for you. Because they're not dead. Because they're not dead. We're not, yeah. We don't pray to the dead. <laughs> Someone said that to me on Twitter yesterday when oh, I dude, announced the, the show. The Twitter Protestantism stuff is so bad. Like it gets just inflammatory. Like it's necromancy. For, for, Necromen. Well, it's like it's it's algorithm farming or not algorithm farming, engagement farming on Twitter is what it is. Yeah. Like that five solace page, like Mary can't hear you. She's dead, bro. Ha ha ha. You're like you're that's the fruit it's of evil. the Protestant. I mean, it's like, OK, well, what can you expect from a whole theological worldview that's built in protest of the truth? Have you read some of these uh, Protestant transliterations before, like the message Bible or like the Knox Bible? Dude, you like you don't even is this a Bible that you're even reading? And people are like bringing that to church and they're reading, this is the Bible. I'm like, oh my goodness. Like it's it, just for, just for comedy sake, go and look up the message Bible transliteration. That's funny. I'm going to look Oh, but it'll up. blow, it'll blow, blow your mind. It'll the absolutely. Ronald somewhere. Knox Bible is based. I love the Ronald Knox, but that that's probably not the one. That no, that's not the same. I don't, I don't believe it's the same one. <laughs> that would be, that would be truly remarkable because Ronald yeah, Knox yeah. is very Catholic. Yeah. Uh, so, Nick, were you going to say something there, man? No. Okay. So, I was going to say, uh, I got a jet in a few minutes here, but there were some other questions that I had here. So, I think this would be fitting for a part two conversation. How would you guys feel about that? I'm sure we'll get some response and backlash to this as well that we could incorporate into the part oh, yeah. two as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, let's par maybe park it there. And then the next time we come around to, um, you know, me leading this this podcast in a few weeks here, we'll get to part two. I think we can do this, next week. We can. I, I'm down. Yeah, we to can do just go back oh, and back. Yeah, if you yeah, guys are go back down to doing, we have yeah, the power. Okay. We do have. The we power. will convene the council. Okay, good. <laughs> I just want to tell uh, one thing before I forget. There's a really cool yep. bit in Macbeth Shakespeare's play where Lady Macbeth is summoning the demons to possess her to get ready to help kill King Duncan. And in the invocation, she tells the spirits, um, fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. And mm. that's an echo of full of grace. She wants to mm. be completely full of the demons. And that's what Nick was saying about the devil versus Mary as femininity. And that feminist spirit hates Mary. And people listening should just go away and scratch their heads and think about how come we've got all this Protestant hatred toward Mary and yet they've got female priests. Yeah. And, and what I will say too, what was 
further convincing of me to finally coming around um, was praying the rosary for the first time. Mm. If you have not experienced the the weapon that is the rosary, Protestants try to, you know, um, control your emotionality. Protestants can pray the rosary too. That's what convinced me to come the other way. You can do it. You can call upon Mary as well. I would convince you to do so and encourage you to do so. Um, I would encourage you to stop thinking that you can interpret the Bible by yourself. And if if you are truly in seek, I think Jesus said that the the the, the church and His Word is like a hidden treasure. And, and truthfully, in this whole journey, it, it feels that way. It's like you really got to seek the truth. Read the early church fathers. Pray the rosary. Go talk to a local priest. Listen to see mask, of course. And then you will become, you'll, well, you'll be brought closer to the truth. But the truth, just like uh, some would say my father, Will Nolan, would say, the truth hurts at first but heals <laughs> in the end. And, and certainly I'll say in conclusion of this episode, as I get, well, as I've transitioned over my reversion to Catholicism, I've experienced a fullness of the faith and a closeness with the faith and like a, a a softening of my heart fundamentally and peace that comes with my faith that transcends understanding. And it's no coincidence that it completely coincided with me coming to Catholicism. So, And you guys were a big part of it. So praise God. I'm grateful for you dudes. Yeah. The backlash for this episode, I'm sure it's going to be real, but I love you guys anyways. But uh, we'll get back to this next week, boys. We love we love you too, Mike. And we're we're all yeah. disappointed to hear that you transitioned as you reverted. <laughs> Reversion should have it should have precluded the transition. <laughs> we're gonna that can be one of the first uh, questions for next week. Mike. Yeah, like, I'll put that one down. Good catch. My, <laughs> Good catch. My, Mike's yeah. actually um, transhuman, aren't you, Mike? Because it was when I, 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 I made love to a forklift, and that's why you could then date hundred. <laughs> that's that's exactly right. That's how two, it was my fault. He fornicated the... with a forklift. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two of the preview questions that I know you have more, Mike, that we haven't seen, but that we didn't get to this week is explaining and justifying purgatory, just for a little uh, sneak preview of next Friday, and uh, extra ecclesium nola salus, which is no no salvation outside the church. There there are some nuances there that are requisite, but and and also we just put the punctuation point on um, Jesus did not have brothers; he had many many cousins. There you go. And then you know what? There's going to be a couple of more that I want to bring to the table as, as, as well. So it'll be a fruitful conversation. Gentlemen, have a blessed weekend. We'll chat soon. God bless. God take bless care, you everybody. See you guys take God care. Bless.